Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to the uh, latest episode of the Hard Compound Live. Uh, for those of you uh, who um, uh, who don't know, uh, I'm Rich, and I run and operate the Hard Compound here in the UK. Uh, we're a one-stop shop for all things motorsport, um, and we can be found on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we put out three articles every day uh, here in the UK, uh, morning, lunchtime, and written articles and they take the uh, form of um, 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 race reviews, race previews, throwbacks, breaking news, um, birthdays, uh, favourite cars and bikes, uh, liveries and just some fun things that we like to put together just to share a love of motorsport which is why we are all here. Um, so do come and give us a follow uh, as I said uh, just search for The Hard Compound, Facebook, YouTube, Chip <laughs> Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and Instagram uh, and come and join us for all the fun. Um, in case you haven't noticed, we also do live video interviews such as this one. Uh, these go out um, on our Facebook, our YouTube and our Twitter channels. They're automatically saved in the video section on Facebook and the live section on YouTube. And we're in the process of putting all the audio onto podcast providers so you can download them and listen to them all back. Um, we've done over 100 of these. We've got some uh, we've had some fantastic guests. I'm not going to name them all. Uh, we have had the honour and the privilege of speaking with uh, Mr. Mario Andretti, with uh, Mr. Jackie Ix. We've had um, um, uh, Hans Stuck, uh, John Watson. Uh, we've had uh, Mr. Chip Ganassi, uh, Frank Durney, the legendary F1 car designer. And we've had a range of drivers from across the motorsport spectrum, uh, from Formula One and IndyCar and sports cars, guys uh, such as um, uh, Mr. Derek Warwick. Uh, we've spoken to um, uh, David Brabham, Stephanie Hansen. Emanuele Piro, Mika Salo, um, Carl Vendlinger, um, uh, Alex Polo, Will Power, Danny Sullivan, uh, Ari Leyendijk, Alanza Jr., um, Martin Donnelly, uh, many, many, many terrific drivers from across the motorsport spectrum, from touring cars and GTs and things like that. Um, I mentioned one uh, German legend there, Mr. Hans Stuck, and we've got another uh, top, top driver from the wonderful country that is Germany, one of my favourite countries. And we've got one of my favourite uh, drivers uh, from that country joining us uh, right now. Uh, he has uh, just joined the British GT ranks with two, with two Seas Motorsport. Uh, he's a Mercedes factory driver. He's a DTM champion. He's uh, stood on the podium at the Nürburgring. He's raced at Daytona. He's an ADAC GT Masters champion and much, much more. Uh, so we're going to bring him in right now. Uh, so do please join me in extending a very, very warm welcome to Maximilian Goetz. There we hey are. Hey guys, good evening. Uh, great to join you. And yeah, looking forward uh, now to talk about motorsport, about any other things. Yeah. Uh, thanks for inviting. And yeah, looking forward for the next uh, few few hours or minutes or whatever. I think it, we can talk forever because there are many, many things to talk about in motorsport and uh, surroundings. So yeah, really nice to be here. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much for coming on. Obviously, um, I've been meaning to make contact with with your team for a while, and when you were announced for the British GT, I thought, right, this is the time to do it. So, um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming on. Um, I appreciate uh, you're an hour ahead over there in Germany, so um, we'll try not to keep you too late. But as you said, we've got lots to talk about, and uh, very much looking forward to it. Um, just want to uh, turn my attention just to the comments section. Uh, we've got a few people in already, uh, 30, 40 people in already. Um, if you have any comments or questions, do put them in to the uh, comments section. Um, and we'll work them in as we go. Or if you want to have a chat amongst yourselves, then please do. Um, but uh, yes, uh, firstly, um, you made your uh, debut here in the UK at Alton Park. And you've just come back from the Nürburgring as well. Um, how's it been in the last few weeks for you? Oh, it, it's been really busy uh, since the beginning of, of the year, to be honest. Um, starting off in Daytona, which is always a nice uh, yeah, start weekend of the season um, with uh, my teammates over there from overseas, with my good old team, Cot of Motorsports. Um, and then we went directly to, to Bathurst um, for the 12 hours, uh, two weeks later. Uh, in between, I was in, in Sweden uh, on the frozen lakes. Uh, I worked for AMG. So uh, we drove some road cars over there. And then, of course, um, a lot of testing. Uh, to be honest, I was never never done before so much testing before a season uh, with my, my teams in British City in, in Europe, um, with um, my new team, Bootsen uh, VDS, 
which I race uh, with Jules Gonon in, in sprint and uh, with this Thomas Roy and then Adam Chris Sudulo. Uh, maybe you know him from, yeah. from UK. So he's, he should be quite famous over there in your home yeah. country. Um, so a lot of testing and, and uh, finally also hitting the notch life, which is always a privilege and really something special. Um, yeah, and we did already the first round, as you mentioned, in, in Alden Park for British GT. So um, this was the first uh, opener for this and also two weeks ago in Porrika, uh, first race of the endurance season. So it's been busy so far, but um, it will continue like this. So a lot of things going on at the moment. And the next big, big thing actually is um, the 24 Nürburgring. So I am, I am, my schedule is fully packed, uh, but which is nice. As a race driver, you want to be in a race car nearly every day. And um, this, I can say, I was nearly in the race car every day in the past week. So, but now it's a bit of um, of a free time uh, for over a week, and and to to recover a bit, to relax, to analyze all the things what happened, to sit down, um, and then come back uh, next week in Silverstone. Wow. That's an incredibly busy start to the year. I'm just thinking we're only in April and you've already raced at Bathurst and Daytona and you've been on the Nordschleifer and wow, it's a, it's a pretty cool start to the year, isn't it? That's, that's very cool. Um, just, I just want to say hello to one person in the comments. Uh, we've got uh, the lady that I've been dealing with to get this arranged. Uh, yeah, like Miriam. Miriam. Hey, nice to meet Miriam, you. Miriam, nice Miriam to thank you me. so much for your help. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have to say a big thank you to her. She's the lady who's brought it all together. So absolutely brilliant. She's been great to work with. So thank you, Miriam. Very much appreciated. Um, so um yeah so obviously you're very busy at the moment you've got a very busy year coming up um but you've been quite busy for the last 25 odd years or something in uh in racing um how did it all how did it all begin for you where did your interest in motorsport come from um yeah so starting from the really beginning um actually my dad was a race driver back in the days but he was really not on it and and he didn't push me at all to be or become a race driver because uh, back in his days um he was really really successful um he did hill climbing he he did the touring cars he was super successful but then from one day to the other his uh, biggest supporter like his dad uh, died so my grandpa and then he wasn't able to do motorsport anymore and he recognized how hard it is to find sponsors to find money to have support from behind and um he they the team actually pulled his car off pole position at norris ring so he did uh, actually free practice qualifying he, he put the car on pole and then he wasn't able to pay the team actually and then the team boss says uh, where is the money and he says I, sorry I, I don't have the money yet uh, but it will come and then um, he decided to push his car out of the grid. Uh, and since since there, he was for more than 15 years really pissed uh, with all this. And uh, he couldn't uh, enter any racetrack or he didn't watch any F1 race. So actually, he was not really like into motorsport anymore. And then for sure, he had contacts from the past and he knows to, to talk about and, and so on. And we watched F1 together as well. But he was he wasn't really like into it. And then um, I watched F1 with him, and I, for sure at this time Michael Schumacher, Ayrton Senna, and, and like in the 1993 times, 1994, uh, I was already eight eight years old, or seven eight years, and for sure um, it was still in free TV in Germany, so we couldn't we could uh, uh, watch every race. And I said to him, look. Uh, you have some trophies at home where they come from and i i want to be like also a race driver like schumacher and senna and so on and then he said no chance no no we don't do it don't do we don't do horse riding or motorsport because actually this is are the, the two most expensive sports uh you can do and yeah, he was he was that's really the upset. Was, that's the same when i was a kid i wanted to be a racing driver my sister wanted to ride horses so yeah like... so, yeah. <laughs> so my dad uh, knew already it's gonna be expensive and and crazy and then he went off for um, a business trip and i put a lot of pressure to my mom driving me to a go-kart track because i knew my dad wouldn't wouldn't do it 
and then finally my mom um he lost he lost under pressure uh from my side and then finally i got the chance to drive a go-kart and since this day actually it happened to me after we went to uh, dtm races um but only when i was good in school so um i i had to i had to deliver nice and, and good results in school as well and then we we joined some dtm races back in the day some f1 races and for sure i was running around the paddock uh, and and i collected autograph cards uh, from the heroes back in the days like ben schneider Lu uh, luca uh, uh, um, klaus ludwig um christian dana you know all these um dtm guys and i said to myself look uh, you are so loved in this sport and you fall in the love uh, this is something you want to do later on but of course this was uh, years years after i started actually a proper karting career um, but I had to convince my dad really a lot to, to support me, to give me the chance. Um, and I need to show him my interest, um, my effort and all the passion, you know? So, and then finally at one day he recognized there is maybe a potential and it makes sense to, to, yeah, come back into motorsport life. And uh, this happened then back in 1995. Wow. I think it's great that you were able to talk your dad back well, maybe not talk him into it, maybe sort of pull him into it, just you know, pull him back into the uh, into the motorsport world. Obviously, it's a shame that it ended for him the way it did, but it just shows that people talk these days that it's all about money these days, and it's all about that. It's always been about money, hasn't it? I mean, going. I mean, form, Formula One began with you know rich guys going racing, um, and uh, yeah, it's a shame that. It didn't work out for your father but great that you were able to get back into it and when you started karting were you always competitive right from the first time you got into a kart or did that come a bit later <laughs> did after a few races did you start thinking i, really I think the first winning. the first ever race i did it was kart kart slalom um so I, dr driving around cones and you know very slow and this uh, this is how I started, and then I won nearly everything back in 1995 and, and 1996, and then we did our first uh, proper kart race on the real um, race track, karting race track, and we thought we are or I am good to use my slalom kart, but this was actually completely different in terms of, of setup and tires and engine and, and mechanics and so on. So we were really like uh, a bit. Uh, naive how you call it um so we were really like stupid back in the days and we thought uh, okay we come there and we, we beat all all the others they doing this for many years and then in the first race i i was i got lapped from others and i we were last by far and then yeah i thought this is not the way we want to do it and then my dad says also no this is not i didn't want to, to spend every weekend to be last and um, there's for sure more potential and then we bought a proper race card and we invested in uh, a mechanic um and supporters uh, my dad started to find sponsors actually um so he he's he thought if we do it right you need uh, some money behind it is always the same uh, without some effort you you put in, you can't be successful in motorsport. And this even in karting already. If you want to be successful, you need uh, good um, material, you need good engines, you need good uh, uh, testing days, a good setup, you know. And and then we recognized, okay, it's it's harder than we we thought. Uh, now we need to invest something, and then we need to make it like big. And this was actually the first step we we did together. Um, then the year after, 1996, 1997, uh, we developed a new uh, strategy to find sponsors. And then we get, got sponsors as well. So my dad was always on it and he was really pushy, I would say, to find supporters and money. And uh, yeah, then uh, finally we, we afford to get um, a good package together. And then uh, my, car, my proper card career started. But... In the beginning, we needed two years to understand how it works, um, how important it is to have good material, the good, to have good, uh, um, ch actually, chance to to show the potential. And this was not easy in the beginning. As I, as young guns, um, I would say, 
I mean, I was nine years old or 10. My dad was uh, 15 years out of motorsport. So it was really tough, but then we got it. Yeah. It's almost like starting new for him as well, isn't it? Things have changed and the, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I, I just, I mean, obviously karting is still quite expensive, certainly over here, um, but it's still a great place to start. And it's obviously, it's been the start point for so many races and you've found that as well. Um, and you uh, got here that you progressed. Um, I did some research here, obviously, and I uh, got, uh, you went through the Green Helmet Trophy Cadets. You went up through the car, the European Championship, the European Championship Formula A, the FIA Karting World Championship. And I guess this is all just, progressing with um you know you get more results there's a bit more interest you can invest more time in the cart and when did you first start to think that you could make a career out of this and you were starting to look towards cars perhaps yeah in the beginning as i said uh, two years have uh, been full of of up and downs um low and ups for sure um and then we recognize we we need to make it like really nice and big and to have uh, some budget. And then my dad started to find sponsors. We did autograph cards. We created an own helm design. We tried already to make like an own uh, an image and an own product out of it, I would say. Um, and then back in the days when I did the, the German championship in cadets, we needed already 80,000 uh, euros per, per year. Wow. And then later on in, um, yeah, when I did the European Championship, uh, we needed hundred thousand euros. So in the end, it was all always always um, about money. Like back in the days, and also now, uh, maybe a bit less than now, but still, twenty five years ago or twenty years ago, you also needed money to start this um, sport. Otherwise, you you wouldn't have any chance. So you need someone behind. Doesn't matter is it if it's your parents or friends or sponsors. You need some money in the beginning to show your potential. And then for sure, we got results. We got um, titles. I won three times the German title. I was second in European Championship. And then I got actually in my last year in 21, when I did the World Championship in karting, I got a factory drive of uh, Swiss Atlas. So um, this was the first year, actually, I, 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 didn't, I didn't pay anything for driving. I got actually paid for driving. And since uh, this day, um, so back in 20, 20, um, 2000, I recognized, okay, if you work hard, if you play it smart, if, you, if you're on it, if you show your talent and your potential and you don't do any fuck ups or mistakes, then um, there is a chance maybe to, to grow. And back right. in the days, um, I mean, there was Sebastian Vettel already uh, around my, my circle, uh, Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg, uh, Robert Kubica, many, many guys. Um, like nearly half of the F1 field uh, raced mm -hmm. against uh, me in back in the days in karting and so on. And wow. then, okay, um, they had also very good sponsors like Sebastian. I remember it was in 1998 or 1999. He got already Red Bull as a, as a partner. And Red Bull back in the days was already F1 uh, a sponsor and so on and so on. So then I thought, okay, um, there are many good names around. They're supporting drivers. If I make it good, if I get results, then maybe there's a chance to to become um, a professional race driver. But I was always dreaming about F1, to be honest. Cool. Always I dreamed about to become F1 driver and world champion. Um, and the dream comes a bit closer in 2002 when I started um, then the Formula BMW Championship. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I was just going to say, I mean, I was like growing up in Germany at the time you were growing up. I mean, Formula One was obviously the place to be with, uh, you know, with Mr. Schumacher. Just absolutely incredible. Um, while we're on the subject, just want to continue to send everyone's best wishes to, you know, to Michael. I mean, you know, we all know what happened and. Yeah, we just hope for some more positive news soon, but we'll see. Um, just want to go to the comments very quickly before we get into the car side. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to guess this guy's from Germany, so I'm, his uh, his YouTube name is Sieben und Dreißig Schubi. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, he's on, uh, and he's just said that he loves the picture in the background you've got there with the Haribo racing yeah. kit in the background. There is That's a very actually cool the Haribo car. Maybe I move it. Yeah, there it is. Um, 
And they have also some like over that. there. There is a, like a nice model car from Haribo. Yeah, this was great, of course, um, back in 2015 and 16. And I think 17, I raced for Haribo, uh, which was like, yeah, really nice to have uh, the gold here on the car and really famous livery. Yeah, I know the fans are missing it for sure. Yeah. Not, for sure. Um, but yeah, it was was great to to drive uh, exactly this car and being on a podium on a twenty four hour race with such a car and such a livery, it's always uh, uh, great to to think about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, very cool. Um, also, uh, we've got uh, a guy um, a guy from Twitter who I've been following for a while. Uh, he's called Eiffel Ronaldo, and he is um, a big fan of his Twitter page. He puts some very cool stuff up there, and he's. Uh, he, he lives around the Nürburgring. So thank you for tuning in, sir. Very good to have you on. Um, <clears throat> oh, we've also got Mike Cole. He's the father of uh, a young racer uh, over in Ireland. She's just done F F1000. She's moving up. And she said, yeah, it's great to hear about your journey and not giving up because it's so hard to get backing. Yeah, and, to, and, and, and sponsorship. Absolutely. Never give up. Never give up on it. Um, so yeah, obviously you were aware of the sponsorship that was around, you know, for Seb and Lewis and all these other guys at the time. Um, how how did you have a a main backer or a main person or a company that that got you the backing to get you into uh, into the Formula BMW series? How how did all that come about? Yeah, so back in the days, my dad was really on it and and found good sponsors like s oliver or sir oliver um they doing they do clothing uh, in germany i had chrono swiss which is a, a watch company watch producer there were many many german like brands out of motorsport around uh, like sucks they were size there were many many supporters and uh, we collected a, a big amount of money to make the next step because i won nearly everything in karting um, I was super successful at this time. And then the logical logical uh, step would be um, Formula cars. And I met uh, Timo Rumpfkeil uh, from Motorpark, um, quite early in on a karting track. And he invited me for a test. For sure, this test was not for free, but I thought, okay, this is a chance to do my first experience. Uh, then before I, I was a part of the... Um, Sack Speed Racing School at Nürburgring, so also very historic, um, which is not existing anymore. Yeah. I did my first steps in Formula Renault cars um, in 2000 or 2001. I, I don't really remember because it's already 25 years ago. Um, so a really long time ago. But um, yeah, when I did karting, I already started to think about to move. Next, next logical step is for sure Formula cars. And then uh, Formula Beam or BMW brought up a new uh, concept about um, uh, yeah uh, supporting young talents, giving them a chance. And there was like a, uh, a shootout, uh, which Timo Glock was involved and some other guys, um, which did the, the same way, the same. They went through the same things and they did already Formula Three at this time. And yeah, I was like just. Enter, enter, oh, my dad was doing it. He entered me in this um, shootout. And then, yeah, I, I was one of the top eight guys in the end. And we got 100,000 euro support from uh, BMW. Wow. And then, um, yeah, we got we got in contact to uh, Peter Mücke, which runs the Mücke Motorsport team, which was at this time super successful in Formula BMW, Formula 3. So Stefan Mücke, actually his son, he raced in Formula 3 with Markus Winkelhock. And um, this this team was for me the best team in BMW, and yeah, we got the money together. Um, we talking about back in two thousand and, and, and two about three hundred fifty thousand euros. So this was a lot of money at this time. Even now, it's a, a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, I started with um, Marco Holzer actually um, in in Formula BMW and I become vice champion. So yeah. there was just one guy ahead, which becomes a fun champion later on. Yeah. Um, but I knew him since karting, um, Nico Rosberg uh, yeah, is Nico. his name. <laughs> yeah. um, so really, yeah, he, I was racing against him since many years before in karting already. 
And then we did the same step to Formula BMW. And back in the days, it was part of the DTM weekend. It was broadcasted from a German um, a podcaster. Um, so in the end, was really the only series which makes would make sense was Formula BMW. Uh, for yeah. me as a German guy, a German driver, German um, junior series. So yeah, so actually we did well. I become a vice champion. And then we got another support from BMW for the second season because for me, uh, leaving a championship, not being a champion, uh, would, wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. So F3 is too early. Let's do another year, stay with the same team, same guys, same engineers, same mechanics. Yeah, and then in the second year, in 2003, I become a Formula BMW champion, which was really, really great. I won many races. I had a very good flow. Uh, we had a very good uh, season uh, with many, many podiums. I think seven or eight podiums in a row. Um, so it was really successful. And of course, uh, if you if you become a, a junior champion, doesn't matter it's, if it's in Formula Renault or Formula Ford or Formula BMW, I think there are some team bosses around even in a phone which are looking at you and having an eye on you yeah. and um, observing you and giving you at one day a chance for the next step and this is actually coming out of formula bmw it's uh, formula 3 so this was then after in 2004 my next step that was the next step um <clears throat> i just want to touch on that 2003 season as i said i did research and i looked into this um because obviously i only became aware of you a little bit later i've got here that you uh, on the first weekend of that season, you took pole the fastest lap and a win at Hockenheim, uh, where you'd already taken a podium on your first uh, weekend in the series in 2002. So Hockenheim, clearly a place that you like. Um, but then later in the season, as as you said, you had seven podiums in a row at Adria, Nürburgring, Lausitz Ring and Norris Ring. Three wins in a row. You got another one, another win at the Nürburgring, one at Zandvoort, podiums in Austria. I mean, that that's a... That's a pretty amazing season, you know, to for just your second season in car racing. I mean, obviously you were with Muka Motorsport and you knew they were good, but did you think you were going to be that competitive in the first season? Uh, because it's your first season in cars, but you're in a very good team. Were you trying to not expect too much of yourself or what, what was going on there? For sure. Um, coming out of karting, won nearly everything what I, which I drove or what I drove. Um, I had pressure, of course, I was um, 16 years old, um, I had a lot of pressure, I want to be good, I want to show the potential because I knew if, if you're doing well and if you become champion or if you're good, then the chance becomes even higher to become a professional race driver and to get uh, the chance to, to be an F1. And for me was the trigger uh, i have to say because nico rosberg won the first year um, and the first prize was uh, a f1 test with uh, williams back in the days yeah. so he he won um this f1 test and i was second i, I didn't have anything i just got a nice trophy and that's it Anything so uh, he become he, he was uh, getting the f1 test and i got a nice trophy so what what is the next uh, step for sure you want to become champion um, and this uh, uh, drive was, yeah, drives me uh, when, since when I, we started testing in the beginning of 20, uh, 2003. So in the end, I talked to, uh, to Peter Mück and said, look, uh, everything I want is this F1 test to, to, to um, dream, dream of my, my, my dreams, kind of. And, and, yeah. and this was something uh, which, which uh, pushed me a lot and also my mechanics. I said to him, look, if, if you win this, um, I will drive F1. This is the, my my biggest dream and my biggest goal. Yeah, and then um, I think testing went well. We we've been many too many test days, and we been always on top of the the ranking. We had a very solid um, setup, and the mechanics were really familiar with me. Uh, it was more feeling like um, yeah, joining a family and and having friends around instead of uh, I need to show something here. Everybody knew, and even maybe myself, and you need some kind of confidence, self-confidence, to be honest. 
um, we have a big chance. If everything works well and in our hands, for sure you need some luck as well to, to win anything. But if it works really well, then the chance is really big, um, especially after the first uh, season. Um, we have a good chance. And Nico went to F3. So my biggest actually contender were gone. And uh, for sure, some news entered, like Sebastian Vettel came in as a yeah. rookie. I did my second year, so I had a little of advantage to him. Um, and then he became vice champion and I was champion after the year. So yes. everything everything perfect, everything fine. And um, yeah, so I, I had a, quite a good confidence to, to be good, but to winning such a championship with so many good drivers around, um, yeah. you really can't expect this before you start a season i think uh, we went through up up and downs as well but in the end i think we had a very good self-confidence and i think that's very important to be uh, successful yeah absolutely and yeah you, you were confident in yourself and the team and the car and everything and you, as you said you won the championship i mean that must have been a great feeling your first championship in cars i mean it, it kind of feels yeah. like a silly question obviously <laughs> it's a very silly question yeah. but that that yeah, was you, a great you, yes you can... to do this We've been really close to uh, Williams, to uh, BMW, to F1 team. We got an um, invitation for many meetings with them. We talked to Frank Williams back in the days, to Montoya, to Ralf Schumacher. Uh, wow. We wear uh, actually the same suits than the F1 guys. We had the same sponsor logos on it. Um, so you actually felt like a little F1 driver. Um, and you were really linked to the F1 team and you really thought if I win this, I will become the next uh, world champion in F1. Sure. So sure. Um, as, as a 16 years old boy, imagine, you know, you won Formula BMW, you you have this, uh, the BMW logo on your chest, you know, um, you are linked to F1, the car looks nearly the same. You think you will become the next Michael Schumacher, but the reality was a bit different. Um, the next step was F3, which was uh, even even harder. And everybody went through F F3 back in the days. Um, and you need to prove yourself in F3 to become a proper uh, chance uh, in F1. And I have to say, I become I never become this F1 test like Nico Rosberg and Sebastian Vettel after me. I don't know what happened in this year in 2003, but um, I just again, I just got a trophy and that's it. So wow. I was end of the year. I wow. hope for getting a, such a present to, to get a F1 taste, but this um, never, never happened. So wow. this was a big shame. And yeah. this even, yeah. even more motivated me um, to, to be good, to show again your potential in F3 um, to become this chance at least at, at, one, at one day. I mean, I mean, that must have been a huge disappointment. I mean, I, I'd, I'd have been furious. Um, so um, um, the actual headquarters of Williams is about 30 miles in that direction from where I mm -hmm. am. So I think I think I think they owe you a test. I, I think they owe you one. I think uh, that needs to I think that needs to happen. Um, but um, you, so you've got the championship, you've got the confidence, you've got all the that kind of dream of F1, you step up to the F3, well, it was the F3 Euro series at the time. Um, w was it a big jump from, from Formula BMW into Formula 3? Did, did yeah. it feel like a really big step at the time? Yeah, it was It was uh, actually a big step. Um, it was really like coming from, how to say, now, if you compare it to now, coming from a, a production road car to a GT3 car. Wow. So the step is like miles away. It's like 10 seconds per or 15, 10, 15 seconds per lap. It, it's a big step. You have different aerodynamics. Uh, your neck uh, hurts after one day of driving a lot. So you, you're not even able to, to hold it back. Um, it was going up and down left and right uh, after one day of testing. Um, so it was a big step, of course. Um, I, I got a trainer. Um, I trained every day, nearly three, four hours uh, to prepare myself. Even I, I was champion in Formula BMW, but this was an, a different different level. And of course, working with engineers more in details, um, testing. We could change uh, gear ratios. Um, we could change right heights, aerodynamics on these cars wow. back in the day. So this was a lot on develop. Uh, developing cars, race cars. And this was uh, my first time ever I, I did this. 
And the first year I was uh, doing F3 was in 2004, and I ran a Toyota engine. So on a Toyota Tom's engine with uh, Collis, and I didn't have any teammates around. So I was a single driver in, in the team. And yeah, so it was even harder for me to, to judge yourself, to compare yourself to others. Actually, in a team where, where you have two, three different drivers, you always compare and you have data comparison and so on. Yeah. But this never happened to me. So I was by my own. I need to learn by myself how to improve. For sure, we had some data from back in the days, but um, it was not comparable um, to, to these days. And it was really tough. Um, the engine was a big poor uh, in this in this year compared to Mercedes and Opel. Opel was really strong in in, in, in this kind of, of period, and we just had not a good year. Um, I was disappointed after the season. I invested five hundred thousand euro on my sponsors in F three, um, and then for sure um, nobody talks about um, Formula BMW champion anymore because this was in the past already. Sure. So. You, you've been always such good, like your last race result is. And for sure, this season in 2004 was really shit and bad. And then I need to rethink myself and need to rethink what we are doing now. But I decided to, to stay in F3, to keep going. And uh, the sponsors uh, likely believed in me still. And then in 2005, we did the next step. Yeah. So it was really, really le tough learning years. Uh, and with a lot of disappointment uh, in these days, but um, I still saw the chance, um, if I'm good, to become a, a really good race driver and professional race driver. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people underestimate that kind of fact. You know, you've stepped, there's a huge step into a new series. There's, and as you said, there's no teammates to learn from, there's no data to compare against. I mean, you're almost going into it almost blind, and it's, must have been incredibly difficult and obviously throwing in to the fact that you were now on some unfamiliar circuits you know, you were at Estoril and Poe and Magni Cor and Bruno and you, know, you got a new car a new series new circuits you're doing it pretty much by yourself I mean that that's incredibly difficult that's incredibly tough and I think you know I think it's great that you're able to just like keep going with it stick at it and you obviously knew your own ability if you just had the opportunity type thing um and yet i've got here was it 05 and 07 and 08 and you were kind of with within the series there were small bits of progress but it never really quite came together did it yeah so i did i had really only one good chance it was in end of 2005 um because at this day um ben schneider um most of you know him yeah, and uh, he supported me. He he tried to give me some advice and help, and I'm um, like a mentor. And he did a contact, and even uh, Peter Mücke, which I won the the Formula BMW title two years ago, uh, before. Uh, he invited me to uh, Norbert Haug, and uh, Norbert Haug uh, back in the days he was um, yeah chief of Mercedes Benz Motorsport, and he um, was controlling the the junior program. He gave engines to drivers he supported teams and so on and and i got uh, in contact to him and then in the same time with uh, frederick Vasseur, which is uh, known as a f1 ferrari yeah. team principal so a very good guy a french guy um very successful back in the days with um, hrt and asm and so on and i met him and he gave me the chance because adrian sutil a friend of mine um, he was teammate of Lewis Hamilton in, in 2005 and uh, Adrian was already vice champion and he couldn't become a, a, a overall champion because Lewis Hamilton, he was already champion. So, and then he got a chance to drive a one GP back in the days. This was like a nation, a national cup. Yeah. Country. Yeah. Seaters. And uh, he decided to, to, um, to drive this instead of uh, doing one more F3 race because he couldn't afford any anymore. Um, and then I got his his seat uh, on the side of Lewis Hamilton in ASM. And I finished uh, straight away on the podium um, with uh, Lucas de Grassi and Lewis Hamilton being on the podium was such a nice feeling, so great. And and uh, behind were like Paul Di Resta, Sebastian Vettel, Leuk Duval, 
um, many big names, you know, I yeah. they just were behind me. And this uh, opened the eyes a bit and this showed me um, you need actually a perfect team, uh, good engines to be, to show your real potential. And then after the last race in Hockenheim, which I finished P3, I talked to Frederic Vasseur and I offered him uh, my sponsor money, I would say. Um, and I said, look, uh, Frederic, this is my amount I can I can bring. It's I felt already okay. This is this is safe because I delivered a good result. He he wants he wanted me to race for, for him, but then uh, we he came up with a crazy number of of, uh, of budget he wants, and it, was, uh, and it was like one one million uh, euro back in the day. So really a lot. I just had four hundred thousand, which was already a lot of money. Yeah, and uh, and then yeah we 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 couldn't we couldn't afford to to bring the full budget and then in 2000 and um yeah six actually i was yeah sitting home i i, I yeah. decided for myself to to stop motorsport because this business uh, like my my dad experience already 15 years before 20 years before it's really shit you need tons of money yeah uh, the best team um, talent for sure talent without any talent you can do anything but for me even even bigger is there the money and contacts and the, the right team the right seat yeah, yeah and then uh, i decided for myself to stop finish my school and, and do something else and my dream was uh, actually from one second to the other gone to become a professional race driver and then yeah one year after in 2007 there was another chance and I tried again to to show my potential and my talent and yeah I got another uh, two years actually or one and a half years in F3 wow. Just got then, to with, show you then, with, then with Volkswagen which was more developing and, and bringing the Volkswagen brand into Formula 3 so the first one and a half years have been really really hard and it was more testing and developing uh, bringing the engines forward and I got a chance, but this time I got paid to to drive in Formula 3. I knew it wasn't the, the best team, the best engine at this time, but I could race for free. In F3, that's something crazy. Yeah, Actually, no. everybody has to pay. I got paid to drive F3, and this was for me, okay, maybe this is a, another chance um, to to get, uh, get you up in, in direction F1, but um yeah so this was also a tough learning and uh, hard learning for me and then um, finally i stopped f3 driving in end of 2007. yeah right <clears throat> it's, fun, it's amazing because there's so as you said there's so many good drivers out there such as you know yourself and there's two guys that you mentioned there who people who only judge a career by f1 which is a ridiculous thing to do but uh, Lucas Degrassi and Adrian Sutil, I mean, two very, 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 very good drivers, aren't they? And they never quite got the opportunity. Um, you know, obviously, Adrian Sutil went and, you know, raced for Force India and did well. But, yeah, I mean, I, I thought he was even better than that. I think he could have gone, you know, right the way to the top with the correct opportunity. It just, as you said before, you need a bit of luck sometimes. Um, unfortunately, it's always the way it is. Um so when you made the switch from single seater racing to uh i believe it was the lamborghini uh super trofeo um two very very different types of car uh you probably couldn't get too much more different on the on the racetrack how did that all happen was it down to finances or was it an opportunity that came up in the lamborghini for those was it three rounds three races yeah so after in 2007 um I stopped again with motorsport because I didn't have uh, money. Uh, Volkswagen stopped the developing program, um, and the teams who who run, who run the F F Volkswagen engines they asking for money. And I said, look, I was t driving now the last two, nearly two years for free. Now you asking for money, so there's something wrong. So, and I was already 23 or 24 um, at this time and a bit maybe too old for uh, f3 and then i decided to stop to do something else i i start working as an instructor for european speed club which is a german uh, agency 
who runs Porsche cars and then some other things around uh, Europe on racetracks. And I did uh, like coaching as an instructor. I did education as an instructor. Um, I learned all this. Uh, I brought my knowledge into, into this and I teach amateur drivers actually to drive race cars. And I met a guy, uh, Achim Winter, back in the days, and he was doing uh, Super Trofeo. Right. And then he, he invited me to race with him as um, as an expert. He is like the M, I'm the expert, and I teach him to drive a proper, a proper race car. And he paid for all. And this was also the start of the GT Masters um, strategy back in the days. And also the program, it was a pure pro M, which means amateur and a pro a driver in one car sharing a race car. And uh, this was the case. So Achim paid the whole season. I teached him and I got the chance uh, in my qualifying, in my sessions to, to show again my potential, my knowledge and, and my speed. And we put the car uh, on the podium a few times. And um, the year after, in 2010, we did uh, one race in uh, GD Masters or two races um, on a on a BMW Alpine, Alpina, yeah. on an Alpina B6. Uh, this car is a bit unknown because it's really rare. Um, so we raced uh, Super Trofeo, then the year after GT Masters, um, always as, um, as an expert on the side of an, of an M, amateur driver, as a coach. And I think this was my way back into yeah, proper motorsport because um, I didn't got money for this, but at least my seat was paid from the amateur. And this was for me very important to yeah, get at least a chance to, to show something. Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a different way back in, uh, which is cool. And again, from the research, I didn't realize this. I uh, this, this may be incorrect, but I saw on the grid for that series. Now, people who are a bit younger may not have heard of these names, but I remember seeing all these <laughs> names when I was when I was young. There was like Peter Cox was on the grid, Beck BTCC driver and Formula Three and did many, many things. Andy Wallace, who we know legend in sports cars Le Mans winner Ivan Capelli uh, one of my favorite drivers as a kid and he's vanished off the face of the earth these days and Marco Apicella they're all on the grid and I remember watching all those guys in F3 I raced with him imagine how old I am <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> so there wow, was Heinz, there was cool. there was uh, back in the days there was Heinz Harald Frenzen Peter Cox uh, as you mentioned uh, uh, Ivan Capelli uh, wow so many so many big names yeah um i was uh early early 20s um 21 22 23 um i raced with them uh, as, a, as a young gun as a non-experienced guy for sure i had some experience from uh, f3 and formula bmw and karting but in touring cars or gt cars the driving this the style itself it's so different the behaving of the car it's so heavy you have a roof on top the car is so heavy uh no aerodynamic uh, in the car so the corner speeds are much slower um so the car is much more rolling so all the behavior is so different and i need to adapt it myself but we had uh, some good success and then uh, again at one day achim winters decided to stop um, because of family um, um reasons um, because he got married he got a baby and then his uh, business uh needed a bit more care of him uh, to to grow and to to be successful still yeah and then um yeah i did uh i met another gentleman i would say uh not far from my home where i live um and he did uh tof, um, the ferrari challenge so in the end um always like there was, there's been always people around with money and they could drive a race car but not good enough and i t teach them to become better and this was actually um for me the the thing to to get a, a race it actually so um i i prostitute myself <laughs> <laughs> to them um to yeah to teach them and to get at least uh, a few new set of tires and the seat time to show my my speed yeah, well, some, you know, sometimes you need to do that. You know, you need to say, right, <laughs> this is what I've got to do. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, and it kind of started you on this kind of GT route that you've been down on the next, what, 14, 15 years now. 
Um, yeah, there's there's lots of love in the comments for that comment you made. That was great. <laughs> we like that. Um, yeah, lots of thumbs up in the comment section. We like it. Um, so uh, I saw that you did uh, something that I've never heard of, the 24 hours of Cologne, I, of, yeah, of Cologne. I, I'd never heard of that before. I'll hold my hand up. Um, what, what was that? This was the place to be. Um, this was a karting race, a 24-hour kart race oh, in right, Cologne. Okay. And everybody, like all F1, F3 drivers, near, uh, even F1 drivers like Nick Heidfeld uh, back in the mm -hmm. days, been, uh, been there, uh, Ben Schneider, Wow, many many guys uh, from Europe, from Germany, especially, and this karting kart race was uh, broadcasted in German TV, um, and uh, this was the first race uh, of the season, and you could show um, your your speed, you could be together with um, all the heroes back in the days, uh, F3 drivers, DTM drivers, F1 drivers, being in the same team in the same weekend in the same race. And this was really popular at this time. Um, so I think we won a few times a 24 hour race at, at Cologne. I don't remember how often, or at least finishing on the podium. But um, for sure, this was always a place to be and so nice. And this was actually the season opener uh, for us to do th this card race uh, in, in Cologne. Wow, I'm going to have to do some research onto this because yeah. I know a bit about motorsport. I never, I, but I want to know more about that, so I'm going to have a look yeah. when we're finished. Um, but yeah, uh, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you had a couple of races uh, in the GT Masters uh, in in the in the BMW Alpine B6, as you said. Um, 2011, full first first full season in the series. That was in the that was in the 458, wasn't it? The Ferrari. Um, this was also a great story. Uh, I met another guy, I met another gentleman, but he didn't want to race by himself. So his son wants to, to race and he, he thought he will put his son on my side. He can learn from me. Okay. And he bought a uh, Ferrari Challenge car. This uh, four, I don't remember really, 455 or something, I don't know. Um, and he bought uh, the challenge car and he thought he will he can drive in, in in part of the gt masters race and back in the days it was true you could race even with a cup car and this was actually a cup car um in the same race than a, a gt3 car um in 2012 there was no gt4 existing there was nothing around it was just carrera cup a porsche carrera cup um and and ferrari challenge and trofeo lamborghini and that's it but you could um, enter with such cars and also in the GT Masters race. And then we did the first two, two weekends and we thought that's not, the, I mean, we, are, we were last. Uh, um, with this car, we were eight seconds lower than a GT3 car. That's also not the way uh, to go. And um, I found a nice sponsor um, because I knew if, if, if I showed the potential here with some good results, I become, or there's a chance because now, uh, all the manufacturers um, have been involved since since um, starting of the GT3 program, like Audi, Lamborghini, Mercedes, and BMW. Uh, if I show a good potential and good results, maybe there's a chance to become a factory driver. So I, I started again searching sponsors, and I found luckily a, a good sponsor. Um, it was uh, Mustering, which is still my sponsor since since there, and also a big furniture company threw out uh, a friend uh, from Würzburg and then yeah we thought okay now we have budget now we have uh, a good branding a good name uh, a young talent driver on my side but driving the Ferrari this makes absolutely no sense uh, we need to make the next step we need a GT3 car and the, actually the plan was um, to to do a Porsche Carrera Cup in 2011 and I was testing in in uh, Valencia uh, with uh, F Team Farnbacher. Uh, it's a German uh, team, which uh, only the two sons still racing, Mario Farnbacher and Dominic Farnbacher. But the, the father of them, um, they, he had a, they had a ra racing team. And I, I was testing with them um, in, in Valencia. And then I met um, actually the, the team owner, the team boss of MS Racing in the pit lane. And I knew there is an, another brand new SLS in the trailer, um, but never used. It's a brand new car. And we run at this stage the Ferrari. So I thought 
we need to do something else. We need to change something. Um, I know there's a team with a brand new Mercedes. Let's go there, put the money on the table and we get uh, an entry maybe with, uh, with the Mercedes. And then finally it happened. I went there, I talked to him and look, there's some, some sponsor money. We have budget. Let's drive together and let's do um, the season together. And then he offered us a good deal and we signed a contract in 2011 after the first two races on the Mercedes uh, GT3 or SLS GT3. And the rest is history, I would say. Uh, wow. since, since, since then, uh, I'm yeah, linked to Mercedes AMG and to linked to Mercedes Benz. Uh, not as a factory driver back in the days, uh, it become, I become later a factory driver, but um, in 2011, I remember my first race at Sachsenring. Um, yeah, it was my first ever race on a Mercedes. Wow. And it became the first of many, obviously. Um, it was, but I, I love that, you know, you kind, of, you kind of saw an opportunity. You know, you thought that we've, you've, you had the whole package, but not, but not the car you wanted and uh that's comes great. later you just have you have to just make a nuisance of yourself go and go and annoy someone uh, you know go and bang on their door and and uh and like get get a deal done that that's how i get most of my interviews to be honest i just i just become annoying um but it was great that you were able to get into mercedes that first experience and, and you know, as you say uh one of the biggest german manufacturers there are i mean you guys are quite good at building cars and mercedes is <laughs> is one um is one one to be with um i mean there's there's so many that i could go on to i, I just want to go into 2012 just before we start picking on some of the later uh stuff um you were racing um in the yeah it it, it was the it was the sl5 AMG GT3, I believe, um, with um, uh, Sebastian Ash. Am I right in thinking that is son or something of Roland? Uh, there must be a relation to Roland Ash in there. Um, yes. So I met I met these guys when I was young, when I was 10 years old. I met them uh, as a young kid uh, on a racetrack, uh, even Ben Schneider. I collected autograph cards from them. And right. these guys been been always the heroes for me, like Klaus Ludwig, Roland Asch, Bernd Schneider, yeah. Christian Danner, Nicola Larini, you know, all the ITC, DTM stuff. Yeah. And for I sure, I, 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 I actually met Klaus Ludwig when I was seven. Yeah. Uh, he was racing over here at Brands Hatch with yeah. uh, uh, Steve Soper. Yeah. And yeah. Cool guy. So <laughs> I, I met these guys already 50, 10, more than 10 years before. But then I went through all this shit in Formula BMW was actually good, but then F3 was not as good. Uh, but then I come back to GT racing, to the GT paddock, and um, all the sons of uh, Roland Asch, Klaus Ludwig, uh, been already in, involved in GT Masters because they never did the pure um, ladder in motorsport like karting, Formula cars, and then so on. They went straight into um, GT racing out of karting, uh, they did no formula cars, nothing. They went straight to GT racing. And then there was already a re relation. And then my dad knew, uh, know uh, Roland Asch since his days, back right. in the days, because they raced together. And yeah, they were, they were a contact. And we had another year with a lot of budget and, and good, good opportunities. And um, actually, Oliver Meyer, so uh, this was the young kid which I raced with in 2011. Um, he he want to continue, but I said, look, for sure, it's nice. But for me, I don't see any sense. Um, we will never win anything because you are not strong enough. I need a guy on my side on the same level, um, same approach, uh, same age. Um, and then yeah, we decided to to link together with uh, Sebastian Asch. And actually, I stayed with the team. Um, I got a new teammate like uh, Sebastian Asch. And we had a very good season and we become uh, the first ever GT3 uh, SLS a champion in this yeah. series. So, um, yeah, this was really, really good um, back in the days. Uh, so far for me, the biggest achievement um, become um, GT Masters champion and back in 2012. And yeah, and then the year after in 2013, um, 
I changed the team. I changed uh, not the brand, but the team and the livery a bit and my teammates. And um, I did the next step in my career. So this was still, I was still paying for it. I was still actually a paid driver, I have to say. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> just want to quickly touch on that, that 2012 season. Um, I've got him in my notes. You only actually won one race all year but it was the one that mattered wasn't it it was the you know, because you guys were so consistent all the way through the season i think you finished outside the top five twice i think yeah it was so good all season um and then uh you took the well, there was two races at hockenheim i got you finished 26th in the first race and then you turned it on its head and won the final round of the season to win the championship that must have been a real roller coaster a real crazy weekend yeah we had the entire um puncture on the first race on saturday um and the, our contenders i think they won actually so i think the, the the points delta went went quite big and there was only the the theoretical chance uh, to become champion on sunday but i said to sebastian look there's uh, as, as long we have the really real chance on on the paper we try everything we push the maximum we can and the way it turned in our direction so um this it was also um i learned all this from formula bmw from f3 all the disappointments all the the, the downs which i had uh, to not give up to to push um as much as you can um because yeah, I, for me, there was no other, other way. Um, I want to win this and uh, finally we won it on Sunday, on the Sunday's race. For sure, always with a bit of, of luck. Um, you need this as well. But uh, I think we showed throughout the season a very good, solid results. Um, as you mentioned, many, many races on the podium, always in the points. Um, and this was the key, actually, to win uh, this championship. Yeah, that's the thing. It's... Um... I always remember people were saying that you you don't win championships on your good days, you win them on the bad ones. And if the bad days are still in the top five or six, then you're going to really have a good. chance. Um, no, fantastic. And you, I just want to touch on this. You clinched the title at Hockenheim. You what? You took your first podium in car racing at Hockenheim. I think you, you've, you've, you've had some good results there. Now, I remember the old Hockenheim, the one out in the forest, which is absolutely incredible circuit i remember watching it as a kid. i did it once only it's a shame i was just uh, on the old circuit um through the the woods and the trees yeah. i did only one test day and after they resurfaced resurfed and rebuilt um the, the track um, yeah. as, as it now um but in the end i just it's a shame i did only one one proper test yeah. test day there yeah yeah, real shame. I mean, it, at Hockenheim, as you mentioned, it was really always a home, second home, living mm -hmm. living place, uh, not far from from my home where I live. Yeah, um, I had my biggest achievement there, um, except my last uh, title win in in DTM. We come to this later, um, yeah. but actually, um, yeah, it, it's been always like a, a home place for me. I did so many races there and experienced um and 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 also winning and losing championships because the years after in 2013 14 um we lost uh, or even in 17 18 we lost um the the, T, uh, the gd masters title in hockenheim um so i if you personally asking ask me uh, what what's your favorite moment in hockenheim for sure winning winning uh gd masters yeah okay. um having good good races there but in the end I lost also many championships in Hockenheim, so the the down the down part, <laughs> it's maybe a bit a bit higher than the. So I lost yeah. more yeah. championships than I, I won, but for sure the, the the winning championships are more in mind and and more positive in mind than than the others. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I knew uh, I know every stone I think in in, um, in Hockenheim, and Hockenheim to be honest got got a bit boring. To me because i was testing there nearly every week right. so um i have uh, much much more favorite tracks than than this sure. but of, of course um still good memories and uh, it's my home track so yeah i can't complain that's cool kind of sounds like you you could drive around it with your eyes closed and you'd <laughs> and, and you'd be fine um i mean obviously here on from from this point on it's kind of uh you've done so many different 
GT races in different series and different cars. And I was trying to put it all together in some kind of order, but I kind of couldn't because <laughs> um, you've done so much stuff and it's all amazing. Um, so I've just picked on a few of them. Um, you, uh, let's have a quick 20, let's see, 2014, you went uh, into um, uh, into the endurance series, what I guess what is now the the Fanatec GT yes, mode. Yes. It, was, it was the blunt pound before. Um, was that very different to the GT Masters, or was it uh, just in terms of setup for the weekend and things like that? How was yeah? The so after and... after winning GT Masters in 2012, uh, Sebastian Asch decided to um, not staying with Mercedes um, against my expectations because I thought, look, uh, his, his dad was DTM wise champion in Mercedes. Uh, he is very linked to the to the brand why he he wants to leave now but i decided for myself i stay with mercedes this makes sense i changed the team to um htp motorsport i became an became a new teammate maxi book which was a young young driver from hamburg um so a really talented guy out of uh, formula uh, uh, four uh, he did already one or two seasons in gt racing so super experienced and and ben schneider again and Norbert Brückner, he runs the team as a team manager back in the days. Um, he, yeah, he put us together in one car, and I think we were really successful. We won the, I won the sprint title in 14 with uh, this driver combination with Max. We won in 2013 the 24 hours of Spa. Um, so Ben Schneider was also with us. So and this was something special because in 2013 I was racing with my biggest hero from yeah back in the days when i was young yeah. uh, together you got the chance finally to to being in a factory car um with such a hero and uh doing your first proper uh, long long endurance race and uh, i never believed it before but uh, in the first day we came and um yeah we won the 24 hours of spa um, so there are many, were many guys not um, believed in us at this time, but Ben Schneider, Norbert Brückner, uh, even Gerd Unger, which was at this time HWA uh, head of, of engineering, and he was the, the guy there who who uh, run the DTM team as well. Um, all of them believed in us, and uh, we won it. So this was really like outstanding. This two years in 2013, 14. A vice champion in endurance, a sprint champion, winning 24 hours of Spa, 1,000 kilometer race of Nürburgring. It was just uh, outstanding. Very good um, two seasons. And then um, as a present to be such good in the customer racing program of AMG, uh, I become an uh, yeah, official uh, DTM test of Mercedes-Benz. Um, from Norbert Haug and Norbert Haug was the boss in this, uh, still in this time. This was a, a swap between Norbert Haug and Toto Wolf okay. between, uh, 14, 15, uh, Toto Wolf, um, switched, switched over as a, as a new Mercedes-Benz head of motorsport. Um, and then, yeah, we got the chance, um, and I took it like always, like always before, um, Always when I when I had the feeling and I got a chance, I, I, I tried to took it and to make the best out of it. And the same happened now. I got a chance and I knew uh, if you fuck up this, um, it's done. That's it. You will never become a factory driver or you get paid or you got that even, even a chance in DTM. It's done. So end of 2014, I was very comfortable, comfortable with myself. I had a self-confidence. I was really like really in a good shape in a good mood and then yeah finally in 2014 um i uh i did the dtm test in estoril and in Cheres, and i could yeah get uh, the seat uh, for this 2015 dtm season in class wow. one and obviously it, yeah i mean i'm just loving the fact that Bernd Schneider is there so often because I remember watching him when he was racing for Zach Speed in Formula One, in Formula um, One and, yeah. and then he went into DTM and he's a guy that doesn't get mentioned very often because he's done a, a lot hasn't he he's done a lot it's of crazy. good for German motorsport he he's did have won he become five times DTM right. champion he won the world 
back in the days, the FIA GT World Championship yeah. and the CLK GTR with Mark Webber. You know, Mark Webber was his teammate in 1997. When yeah. DTM or ITC stopped, uh, HWA uh, was building a car uh, in, in within uh, some weeks uh, to participate in the FIA GT World Championship against Porsche and McLaren and so on. And he won the, the World Champion title in the first year with Mark Webber. So Bernd was always a super nice guy, first of all. Um, great family, a great guy, and super successful and uh, grounded. Fully grounded, even with his, his success. And um, yeah, so super nice guy. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, one of these guys, he doesn't get mentioned enough. Uh, he's yeah, really, really, you know, very, he's done some great stuff in motorsport, as you say. Um, just want to touch on, I, we mentioned Spa. I'm going I'm to come to Spa because we all know that Spa is a superb circuit. I, know, I was going to ask about what it's like to drive at night, but there's another couple of circuits I want to ask you that. Uh, so we'll do that very shortly. Um, Let's have a look. Ah, yeah, you see that title, 2014, um, you secured the title in Baku. Now, I've spoken to a couple of people who have driven single-seater cars. Um, I like it. I'm a big fan of street circuits. I think they're a superb challenge for drivers, which I'm not, so that's probably why I like them. Um, I've had, like, Jack Aitken and um, uh, Callum Eilat said they really enjoyed running a single-seater around Baku. I think it's only Harry King I've spoken to who's driven a GT car around there. I was just wondering what it was like for you driving around there. Because obviously it, it's quite a big car. It's a heavy car. It's a most most of the circuit's very narrow, especially going up through the through through the castle area, that big that that narrow section. Um what is it like driving one of these amazing cars around Baku? Yeah, I mean um I did I did before in S3, I did Monte Carlo, I did Po, um, I did some street circuits and I had some experience. Um Norris Ring, of course. Um and then I I I come become um as a leader or second in the championship to to uh, Baku and we were invited from the government uh, back in the days they invited us to do the final race in Baku, but this was actually not on this um actual F1 track. It was uh, on on the old Baku street circuit through all throughout the the old um, Baku city, okay. so it wasn't it wasn't the same. It okay. was even more narrow, more tight. Um, the paddock was like on a parking deck, um, so it was really like uh, if you want. There are some still some on on YouTube some uh, footage from back in the days from two thousand and fourteen. From Baku, so if you're interested, you can look and look at it. Uh, it was really crazy, and for sure, I really enjoyed it because uh, you come there as a potential champion. Um, I liked street circuits, and I'm just enjoyed it. Um, it smelled like like the whole paddock, the whole city smelled like a piece of of, of shit. To be honest, like oil, <laughs> because um, there was this uh, like. Okay. on the on the on the harbor the paddock was on the harbor side and there was only one boat in in the sea on the port actually and this was from the the big boss there um but the problem was they they yeah screwed uh in in the ground like on the sea um to to get all out of out of it you oh, know right, um yeah. so they the whole city smelled like like oil like really badly and so you couldn't go swimming or something. It was just uh, really bad. Um, but the people there are really nice and, and the city was growing. Um, and I become champion. Uh, I think Lawrence Fantor a big, was second in a championship, I remember, with uh, René Rast or something. I'm, I'm not sure. Wow. But um, these guys like René Rast, Lawrence Fantor, um, there were many like Dries Fantor, not, not there, but um, Alvaro Parente, um there were so many like older drivers than me and super successful gt drivers um um and i, I become champion in this in this season so this was also great and um after this um this was also the trigger for mg um to offer me a contract because i was delivering over three years now very good success and results winning gd masters spa uh, sprint 
um, thousand kilometer of Nürburgring. So um, they thought, okay, this would be the next step for him, and he really deserved it to become a factory driver. And then finally, I become in 2015 uh, the DTM uh, factory driver for them. So um, since since then, um, yeah. I have to say, I never paid for racing uh, after that. But um, three years of hard work, uh, a lot of passion I put in. I believed in myself. I never believed it to to get another chance after stopping in 2007 and eight, to be honest. But I believed in myself, and um, finally, I've done it. Um, yeah, and end of 2014 to to sign a nice proper contract you know with amg uh, factory this was something something nice and uli fritz he was the team manager of uh, of dtm back in the days he called me um on the christmas day on the 24th december and uh, he gave me the biggest present ever um i've got uh so that's that this was something special i would say that's amazing yeah i was saying you must be very proud to be a mercedes factory driver because you know You've got to be pretty good, <laughs> you know, to, you know, for for Mercedes to, uh, you know, to, to take you on. And I said that leads nicely into 2015, as you said, with DTM. Um, I, I had a quick look. Driving for Mercedes that year, there was you, Danny Junkadella, uh, Robert Wickens, who obviously, you know, he's recovering and he's doing very, very, very well. You got Paul, Paul DiResta, Lucas Auer uh, and Gary Paffett. That's a Mercedes lineup, isn't it? That, that you must have, it must have felt great to be amongst those guys in under the Mercedes like umbrella, as it were. Yeah, you missed uh, Pascal Wehrlein, who oh, become yes, uh, who become champion in 2015. Yeah, and I raced with uh, Daniel Junkadea um, and uh, with my old team Mücke Motorsport. So Peter Mücke, he knew from ten years, uh, no, twelve years before uh maybe how good i am or what whatever you know so um it's it's funny i won with him the formula bmw championship and 12 years later i joined him in dtm to get paid for racing for mercedes amg so crazy story actually um so a lot of things happened in this 12 years between becoming formula bmw champion and getting a dtm contract so was a really hard work and 12 years of uh, up and downs but um, never gave up. And yeah, so it was really a tough season, learning a lot of learning uh, without not much testing, to be honest. We did we did only had three test days or something before a season. So there were I was rookie and only Lucas Auer. Um, the, the rest was uh, super experienced, like Gary. He did already his eight or ninth year in DTM. Um, Christian Victoris, um, there were many, uh, Robert Wickens, Paul De Resta, they off, they all have been in DTM for many years before. So it was really tough and a uh, big learning curve. But then in, uh, in the last, the second last, two last races at Nürburgring, um, I had Pascal a lot to defend. And, and these days were a lot of political decisions made from the brand. So we were, Hold on to to help actually the teammate to win something. This was um, the one team approach, and for sure, um, if if I don't have the chance to to win anything anymore, uh, but my teammate is able to win a DTM championship, for sure I will help. I get paid for from the brand to race, to do the work, to do the um, interests to work for them and then I did it so why not so then he become a champion and this was actually um also um with our help actually um getting all these points in the end to be to be the best yeah this is great and I've, I've come to this I mean we'll come to uh 2021 um detail very soon which is a very great year for you um but people talk about team orders and things like that and it shouldn't happen and all this kind of thing but people need to understand and i, I don't think many people do that there's a big brand you know just like with like schumacher and uh barrichello at ferrari and things like that there's a huge brand putting huge money into this series and there's a reason why there's more than one car it's a team and it ha and and the team and the name and the brand and the manufacturer have to come first and people don't seem to understand that um 
and obviously that was you know that that year when pascal won it as you say that that was obviously a big part of it um not taking anything away from pascal because he obviously deserved it no no he deserved it he was the best in the year so and he become not uh, but he's on a way to to become a formula e champion uh, with many good names around him yeah and he he showed his potential even if one even if it was not easy for him but he showed the potential and also now in uh, formula e i think he is one of the top runners um he is in a good good mood at the moment he is quick and yeah um so there was a reason also to win DTM in 2015 there's always a reason to win something it's not only about um getting support from a team or you everything falls in your hands no you have to work for it you have to deliver throughout the the season to get points to be in this position in the end to hope to get support from your teammates in the end um yeah. so the 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 season or the championship decider is not in the last race it's as you mentioned before it's throughout the season getting points getting into this position yes to to may get the chance get support and all the luck together you know to be on top in the end it's yeah. not it's not about uh, 10 minutes of the season in the yeah, end exactly exactly as as you say you have to work to put yourself in a position to get the help at the end when you need it or when you want it um you had a couple of seasons uh, in dtm um results weren't quite i guess where you wanted them uh to be did you make the decision to go back to gt masters or was it just the discussion that happened was there an opportunity to come to yeah so GT after masters? in 2015 16 at dtm and then um mercedes decided to um, reduce cars from eight to six um okay. then then we were running out of of uh, potential seat in dtm and then uh, I, I talked to mg and uh, we decided together uh to to step back or where i come from from gt racing as a mg factory driver and um there was also some some uh, good um chances for me again to prove myself with um, patrick assenheimer with gary peffer thomas jaeger i drove spa 24 for example in 2060 uh, 17 um and there were many good um other um topics for me and i saw my personal um career more in gt racing than in dtm because dtm was on the downside yes um, they were reducing cars from eight to six and the rumor was yeah we will stop anyway in two years because nobody is able to pay to 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 afford it anymore because it's getting too crazy too expensive and then i thought for myself a long longer term uh, <laughs> possibility to race to be part of a brand to to get more chances in the future to bring you already in a position if dtm will stop to be already uh, have knowledge and uh, a good um yeah um position uh in the brand for for yourself and exactly did this happen dtm stopped uh, with class one at uh, end of 2020 um, and then they started again with uh, or they started a new generation of, of race cars with a gt3 car um and then i was in the pole position in the end to get a seat to get um another chance in dtm and this already um i got um yeah through everything uh, already after when i when i decided to to come back to G gt racing uh in 2017 so i think everything went in the right direction for me to be honest um, but for sure, maybe the luck I had a bit more than than they used before in this uh, stage. But um, I think I couldn't ask for for more. Actually, um, yeah, everything went uh, the right way. Yeah, that's good. It, it, yeah, some sometimes things just just kind of fall right and yes, you get... fall in your arms, fall in your hands. Yeah, and, and it, uh, for sure, it gives you a chance to go and do well. And I just want to. <laughs> step forward into uh 2018 uh with the man filter um team i mean you were i mean you'd had a couple of years where you weren't perhaps running at the front where you obviously want to be um 2018 it felt like a um like a big step forward uh in terms of results and running back at the front again you were you know you took a pole and a win at most uh in the czech republic podiums in austria at the nurburgring fourth overall in the series uh, must have felt nice to be back at the front again 
Yeah, absolutely. But um, it was very disappointed as well because we were able to win the championship. But then I got um, yeah pushed out, uh, crashed out, whatever from uh, an Audi driver. Yes, uh, Hocken, I remember. Hockenheim turn one. Um, but this could be my uh, third uh, GT Masters winning championship after 12 and 13, where we've been also in in pole, in leading the race, just we need to finish the race, but then uh, the engine blow up um, in 2019, the same again. We were leading the championship, just finishing the, finishing the race, but then I got pushed out. So in the end, um, I had... Yes, Dries, because Leonard's yeah, under, uh, under, yes. under asking. Yes, it was Dries. Um, yeah, so in the end, it's um, it was very disappointing uh, because uh, this would be uh, outstanding to, to win three times. GT Masters never did this before, to be honest. And this would be for sure great to have it on your uh, bucket list and on your uh, Vita. But it's not happened. So in the end, this is also part of motorsport. You are very close. You are very, you think, yeah, it's on my hand. It's in my hands and nothing can happen. But then in motorsport, everything can happen. If you are not finishing the line first, uh, crossing the line first, you are not uh, finishing first. So that's part of the motorsport world and, and game, uh, which I really like. But sometimes it's really painful. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we can't control everything as just as much as just as much as we'd like to things happen but you can't help um i learned that when i was five i've mentioned off camera this is nigel mansell up here Mm. 1986 then my first season watching f1 his tire blew up in adelaide and i realized that even then things don't go your way um one thing I do have to touch on, though, in 2018, you ran the superb yellow snake reptile sort of livery thing I'm yes. um, familiar with. It's a fantastic looking car. I've, I've I've always liked it. It must be great to drive it. <laughs> For sure. And the fan base is huge. You know, uh, yeah. Mamba, we, we in, in Mamba. implemented, invited the Mamba to the racetrack and I raced it um, as the first driver. Um, um, back with my team HTP uh, Motorsport and then Winward Racing with Indy Dontje, Markus Poma, all these guys, uh, Maxi Buk as well, um, and with uh, Lello, like Raffaele Marcello, with Maro Engel. So there were many guys in the past years on the Mamba. Uh, maybe I did the most of them on the Mamba um, in GT Masters and uh, on, on Long on Nürburgring 24. Um, so I, I'm, I'm feeling like a, I'm a mamba, I'm a, a snake uh, <laughs> sometimes. But um, yeah, it's great to be part of such a history uh, like Haribo, this uh, um, historic liveries. Uh, if I look back in 10, 15 years and I can say, look, I, I raced for Haribo. I had this nice car. I look for, I raced for Mamba, Manfilter. I raced for uh, Bielstein. I raced for whatever. And um, there's so many nice, nice liveries. Uh, I, yeah. I was able to drove in the past years. And that's yeah. something really, really nice. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I, mean, um, I think some people know that I get signed photos from all the guests on here and trying to find one for you. I, there, might, there kind of might be five because you've driven so many cool cars. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, we mentioned the Nürburgring, things like that. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, the like 24 hour race there. Um, that's on my bucket list. It's something I'd love to go to. Um, am I right in saying you've competed in the last ten runnings of the twenty-four hours on on the Nordschleife? Um, I'm just wondering your first time sitting on the grid, or 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 before the first before your first time in on the twenty-four hours of the Nurburgring. How does it feel knowing you've got twenty-four hours of driving around perhaps the most famous circuit certainly in Europe probably in the world maybe it was my my ever first year at Nürburgring which was the most exciting one because uh, the first year for sure you are super afraid you are nervous you are um, having so much respect Uh, but back in the days I was not sitting on a GT3 car I raced a Ferrari and challenge car I was not able to to race uh, for the overall podium or overall win. I was just in class and um, I didn't put pressure on myself. I just want to finish the race. I just want to to learn, to get some mileage, to, to learn how to 
um, yeah, drive through the traffic and and to manage all this um, day and night. And for sure, it was it's still and it was and it's still the most demanding uh, from uh, 24 hour race um, in the world for sure. Yeah. Like I did, I did Spa, I did um, many other as well, other 24 hour races, Dubai and so on. I never did Le Mans, but this is also on my bucket list. Mm. A different story, but uh, it's also on my bucket list. Um, but I have to say, and if the, there you can ask many other uh, drivers around the world for sure, 24 Nurburgring is the most demanding and challenging 24 hour race in the world. And yeah, so I did my steps uh, through um, the last years. For sure, my biggest uh, success was P2, P3, P4. Then another P2, two years ago in 2022. Last year we finished P4. So I have some uh, top five results, um, some podium results already. But what oh, for me the most important thing is missing. Uh, it's it's a win uh, at the Nürburgring, and this I want to achieve this year for sure. Um, everybody wants to win this race. Um, it's very hard. It's the hardest race in the world, the hardest endurance race. But Nürburgring, I can tell you, it's something different compared to all others. It starts from approaching to the racetrack. You see already the fans sitting there in the trees for already days and, and hours, uh, partying like a festival. Uh, they they are on it on fire uh, for one more than one week um, and this around the track which is 25 kilometers long so that's absolutely absolutely crazy so the whole atmosphere uh, how the weekend starts already then the the practice sessions the qualifying the the pool shootout the the top qualifying and then i was able to do already six like start uh, stints uh, into the race uh, so you do the formation lap then you start a race. Uh, a lot of pressure is on your on your shoulders to finishing the first lap without any damage. Um, and then, yeah, everything starts after the first lap of the race. I think um, the first year, as, as I mentioned, was not super exciting, well, for sure exciting, but the pressure was not there. Um, the first ever race, I felt really a lot of pressure was uh, a bit later on, on the SLS. Uh, which yeah means we were racing for the overall win, and I think that's something something special. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you said that um, obviously the win is the goal. Of course, it is. That's the main target. But um, even to stand, you know, as a German racer, racing as a Mercedes factory driver on the Nordschleife to get on the podium um obviously you want to be on the top step but that the whole sequence there i mean that must that that must be a huge highlight you know you're thinking wow it's, i'm standing here for mercedes for germany at this circuit it must feel amazing it's it's the biggest uh, highlight of for sure also emotional wise but also in terms of um checked on the bucket list this is missing um for me as well i finished p2 uh, p3 p4 p5 um whatever but uh to winning this race uh, i mean i tried back in the days in my first year in 2013 we come to spa we didn't have any expectations and we won the race uh in the first year straight away uh as as, as rookies uh so why not at Nürburgring? For sure, Nürburgring is special. It's very long. It's very challenging. All the weather conditions, all the the things can happen uh, in in this race. It's it's more than than and on on all others together maybe. Um, but in the end, now it's time to win because also um, uh, Mercedes AMG the last win is back in 2016. Right. So it's already yeah uh, six years ago. Or more, uh, eight years ago. Um, so it's finally it's it's time to win again. Um, we tried everything to prepare ourselves in a good way. I think we we have a good package uh, this year. I have very good teammates like Lukas Stolz, Daniel Junkadeja, and uh, Arjun Maini. So two two DTM drivers and two former DTM drivers uh, in one car um, with a very good team behind. So I think. Everything is set. Uh, now we need some luck and yeah. uh, a smooth race without any contact. 
a good feeling for the traffic, you know, so you need to find your way through the traffic. Um, I think that's the key to win uh, such a race, to be quick in traffic, to overtake the slower cars in a good way. You're not losing too much lap time and um, yeah, having a clear race. I think that's, that's it. Yeah. I think you don't need the super quickest car at the Nürburgring. You need um, a lineup like drivers on the car, which are on the same level um, in terms of experience in terms of track knowledge, um, because everything can happen there. You mentioned like in 2016, there was even snow, yes. uh, water, sunshine, everything was in one race in one, two hours uh, of, of the race. So um, yes, for sure, I will try my best with my team to, to win this. Uh, it's going to be super exciting. Competition is super high as well. Um, but yeah, we try to, to win. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we certainly hope for a little bit of luck, as you say. We always need a bit of luck, especially around uh, especially around that particular circuit. Um, <clears throat> very quickly, we touched on it earlier. You've 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 done the uh, you've done the 24 hours of Spa. You've done 12 hours around Bathurst, which is an incredible circuit. Uh, you've done the 24 hours of, of, the, of the Nürburgring. These circuits to non-drivers like me, non-racers, um, they look incredibly difficult in the daytime but at night it must it, it 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 almost feels like insanity it feels like absolute madness i mean what what's it like driving these circuits at night you've got slower cars the lights the glare you got it, it must so be one one question to you how, how was your highest speed in the dark and on a highway <laughs> um well we live in england so we're a little bit yeah, okay. strict here um it, it may be around a hundred. Okay, <laughs> that's miles okay. an hour. So I yeah, yeah. One... But you felt uh, pretty quick, right? Yeah. <laughs> it it feels double double speed. Jeez. I... It, it felt it felt it felt double speed. And imagine on the on the narrow Nurburgring with uh, so many slower cars around, and pushy pushing GT threes from behind with this high beam lights on on the front. Yeah. You don't see anything from behind because it's flashing you a lot. In front of you, you have such a narrow track with many cars on it. Um, it's it's un unreal. Uh, um, wow. I was uh, I remember two years ago I did a lot of driving and also a double night stint, and um, I stepped out of the car and I need to sit down, and I was asking myself, "Hey man, what you did the last two hours?" Uh, it was like a tunnel you know i couldn't i couldn't remember what i did how i did it uh, uh what, what happened you know and uh, it was like you are so focused and so on it you don't i, I couldn't remember um the last two hours really because wow. i was i was so concentrated it, it's absolutely crazy um wow uh, it's amazing uh, nelson piquet said uh back in the days uh, monaco is like flying with a helicopter in a living room Yes. Um, that's maybe even worse. Uh, with a GT3 car in the night uh, at the Notch Life, I can tell you. <laughs> wow. I mean, there's a lot of things in life that I want to try, but that's not one of them. Um, <laughs> no, that, that's incredible. My goodness. Well, hopefully, yeah, hopefully this year will be your year. We certainly hope so. Um, just to fast forward, I have to mention the, 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 the 2021 DTM season. Um, you've gone back into, uh, you've gone back into DTM. Um, and uh, the pink you know, BWT delivery, the, the water one. I mean, um, I love it. We all love it. it. It just looks good on every single car that it goes on F1 or a Porsche or a Mercedes or whatever. Um, you've gone back in. Did you uh, did you did did you expect to be a title like uh, a like title contender that year? Were you going in thinking maybe we could be good, maybe not? We're not sure. What was yeah. I mean, uh, there was Uli Fritz calling me um, and also Renaud Defour, which, which is a French engineer. And I knew this guy since my DTM times. And with Renaud Defour, I won Spa 24. I won uh, Blob Paw Sprint um, title. So I knew these guys from back in the days. And Hubert Haupt was um, creating a new team, um, uh, HRT Racing or the Haupt Racing team. And 
I knew if this guy is calling me and if they are guys asking me if I want to race with them to fight for the DTM title, because this was the only only goal. We had BWT as a sponsor. We had super support from AMG. We had um, the best engineer there, uh, the, one of the best team managers out there. We had uh, a good band, good band, a band bench of, of mechanics are, around us, and for sure, um, it it come it came together in in beginning of the season. You know, the first talk was in December, and then the final decision was made in March um, to do it. So it, it went over three months developing and and bring people together, and um, and then we start testing. And from the first test day on, I was I was really good. I was in the mood. Um, we saw the chance to to be up there, but you never um, you never can be sure to win a, a title. Um, you can try your best to to be up there, to to be up in front, to collecting points, but you are never you should be never be sure to win anything because it comes different than you than you think. Yeah. So um, it not happened to me, but for sure I was a realistic and I thought, okay, if we if we work hard, if we play hard, then maybe there is a chance um, in the end to to have a decent result. Um, yeah, but then it become it comes uh, differently. Uh, I was collecting many trophies, uh, many podiums uh, throughout the season, and then it comes to to Norris Ring Decider, yeah. which I was uh, P3. We had some some trophies already. I had some points. I never expected anything. Yeah, but then, yeah, it happened. It kind of all happened. I mean, yeah, I was just saying, like we we touched on the consistency when you won uh, won the GT. You must have, yeah. So um, I knew this experience. Again. From, from GT racing already in GT Masters in uh, sprint um, to be successful, to be good, getting points as much as you can. Um, yeah. Even a fourth place, fifth place, sixth place is important in the end to to be up there in, in, in the decider. And this is actually what I did. Uh, we had very good pit stops. We had a very good pit crew, maybe a bit more advanced than the others. Um, so in the end, everything went together. And then for sure, the showdown on Sunday at Norris Ring um, decided the, the whole season. Yeah, um, I mean, and it the word controversial always comes up when we talk about this this final round, and I can see why some people think it would be because how, I mean, you were, I guess, the outsider, I suppose, going into the into that weekend. Um, there was uh, Calvin Van der Linde and uh, Liam Lawson were ahead of you um you won the first race so you gave yourself a chance you know again again i won the first race i brought myself you even got... in, a, in a better position yeah. i showed the potential um so i i did my work already on on saturday saturday um yeah. winning by my own winning um without any help or something it was just pure performance yeah. um the pure motivation my home race because Norris Ring is actually my home race as well. I'm a member of the motorsport club there. So um, it was a dream come true to win a DTM race at Norris Ring already for me. All done, all happy. I will be third in the championship. I won a DTM race at Norris Ring. All fine. But then, yeah. And uh, and that's the thing. I mean, people sort of over overlook that. I mean, you, you, you would superb in that race and it was just one of those races it just you know you you did everything right and you got the win you're in position still i guess the outsider for it and you started was it sixth in that final i think was it six i think you started yep. on the grid um what did you think going into turn one obviously it's the left hand hairpin and it all went off in front of you didn't it um did did you realize that it was Kelvin and Liam that had gone off? Because they bumped. Because was it Kelvin went up the inside, hit Liam. They all went. I mean, away. there was there was already on Saturday a contact between Kelvin and someone else in mm -hmm. like even with Liam. I think Kelvin and Liam. I'm not sure, but there was a contract between Kelvin and someone someone else in turn one. And then after the Saturday race, okay, I thought um, these two guys are in first row. I'm se I'm six um look i had a good season i won yesterday um the chance is really low to to be in front of them after the race to to get enough points to win the title 
And uh, just enjoy your race. Do whatever you did. Uh, enjoy it. Have fun out there. And you will see where you end up. So yeah. um, my my chance to win something was like, like zero. But um, I had 100% motivation to enjoy the race and to make the best out of it. And this was maybe different to the two other guys, which both sitting in front row when everybody wants to beat the other the other one and already had this big DTM trophy in the mind. And I didn't. So I just, um, I was super relaxed. I enjoyed it. I joined the, the race at the start. Um, but I knew deep in my heart, um, there's a bigger chance than you think. And uh, I thought Kelvin will be really hard to Liam in the first corner. He will he will try everything to overtake him because that's maybe his only only chance in the race to to get him. And then yeah, it comes that um, Kelvin was breaking on the inside too late. He missed the breaking point. He yeah. he pushed uh, Liam and uh, Nick Cassidy out. Yeah. Uh, He's missed it by a long way, didn't he? <laughs> um, I was sitting behind. I really watched it uh, in the first row. <laughs> And uh, it, I was surprised, really. I was surprised that uh, this actually happened. Um, but then I kept focusing on my race and um, I finished the first lap on P3 or P4 already. So um, I thought, OK, one guy is already out of the race yeah, because he left him uh, straight after. Damage. The suspension was broken. Yeah, wasn't yeah, it? Everything, yeah, the front was like it was the steering yeah. column was broken and stuff like that so i said okay this is a good start for me one guy is already out of contention um let's bring home the best result you can you can do here and then um i was doing my race and then we tried to undercut it um uh, kelvin so yeah. i stopped uh, two laps earlier than him and i had fresh or hotter tires on the car than him and he stopped in the last um chance of the pit stop uh, window and he came on track just in front of me, but me on my um, uh, hotter tires. So in the end, this was also a strategic uh, decision in our way. We pitted earlier. We had the chance uh, to, to fight against a car with cold tires coming out of the pit lane. And actually, um, yeah, we tackled. We had some contacts out yeah. of the um, Grundig uh, Hudsonbach. No, it's... Uh, um, no carry we touched once, and then out of a dutzend carry that's the last corner of the Norris yeah. ring. Um, he drove like into my front. We kind of crawled, I, nearly, yeah. I nearly lost the car, it was really going crazy. And then a uh, few hundred meters later, he got his puncture because of this contact. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I thought, good, next one out of the <laughs> contention. <laughs> so, um, it was for sure. I, I had. Not a big smile in my face, but I thought, okay, mm. this race, it's it goes in, in your direction. But then, uh, in the end, it was quite, um, I was super relaxed um, that Luki Auer and, and Philip Ellis were in front of me. So, one, two, three, Mercedes, even behind was one Mercedes. Yeah. So, we had a very good uh, and, and strong um, and race over there for all Mercedes cars. And then... Uh, I knew already before we started the race, um, strategy-wise, what we are doing. And then I hope for that uh, we play the game. We played um, this, what we spoke before the race, like uh, back in 2015 when Pascal Wehrlein won the championship for Mercedes. So we proceed the same way. We followed our, our accomplishment, our rules. And yeah, in the end, I won with... Uh, I think two points ahead of uh, Liam Lawson. Yeah, so, and I, rem- I mean, I remember when it happened. There were some people were saying, "Oh, this isn't good. It shouldn't end this way. Team orders, things like that." But it comes back to what we said before. There's a lot been invested into it by by Mercedes, and com- the you know the brand is complete. You know, and and the cars involved, the drivers involved, are completely within their rights to do what's best for mercedes and that was and and you and you were the guy that could win the championship you'd driven into that position all season you'd 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 done it in race one you'd done it in race two um i didn't see a problem i mean you know i'm i'm either (laughs) i didn't see any problem uh because um 
the the other two el eliminate uh, themselves um, by by yeah. itself, and yeah. I was just doing my my job, my racing for sure. I was in a weaker position, but I had uh, in this stage maybe I'm the I'm the oldest one of them, maybe I'm the most guy the guy with the most experience. Um, yeah. um, so I thought, okay, it it comes how it comes. Um, and I had the feeling, to be honest, when I started the race, something is going crazy soon, and exactly this happened. So, yeah, I, I stayed cool. I did my job. I finished the race, and in the end, the last two minutes or the last two laps, where Luki and Ellis uh, uh, let me let me go, yeah. I think um, that's just a, a, a little little part of the whole uh, season. Yeah, and yeah. Um, then I become DTM chim. It doesn't matter who and how. Um, I, I was I was that guy sitting there and Liam and and, and Calvin on the left and right side. I was in the middle step of the podium. Uh, got a big trophy and yeah. And, uh, and my and, dream and actually it's my big, dream, it? it's and my, actually my dream came true exactly. Um, yeah, twenty three years. Um, 23 years actually after I saw my first actual DTM race at, at Norris Ring. Um, so on this track, so this was uh, something crazy, and I couldn't be more happier and wishing me a better place to, to win that because Norris Ring is my home ground, my home place. And yeah, so this was really, yeah, something I, I felt really um, sorry for Liam because he was. The poorest guy. I mean, Kelvin did like not a nice move on Saturday, on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, he was a bit harsh, but Liam, I, I felt sorry for him because he did a great job over the season. We still have very a good co uh, contact, you know. If we see each other, we have a drink together. We talk about um, the old times. Uh, yeah. I think he will become also uh, the 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 yeah near F1 driver. Yeah. Um, for sure, he he will uh, replace Ricardo um, soon. <laughs> That's my opinion. Yes, I, uh, because yeah. he has the potential. He showed it uh, even in DTM. He was super young at this stage. Um, now he's in F1. Um, I want DTM, so I think it's fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, as uh, as you say, he sort of didn't do anything wrong that weekend. Did he? Just like you yeah. didn't do anything wrong either. It was more Calvin, should we say? But yeah, and and um, and we saw what it meant to you, and we. I actually watched it yesterday and I heard the radio and yeah, it was great. It was a amazing thing. Um, okay, I'm just looking at the time. I mean, just to fast forward, I mean, we've uh, I've, we've got to touch on your arrival over here in the UK. Um, as I said, I've been wanting to contact you and your team for a while, but I know you've been very busy with things. And when it was confirmed that you were going to come and race over here in British GT, which I absolutely love and have done for a long time, I thought, right. I'm going to contact him. I'm going to see if I can have a have a chat. Um, how did it all come about? Because you obviously you've been racing out in Asia before, and now you're uh, getting wet in England, and it's <laughs> going to happen again, I'm sure. But how how, how did it all happen? Um, I got wet last year because of the humidity and um, 30 degrees higher temperature than now in in England in UK. It's more colder, more raining. Um, always, so, always yes but um i knew to cease for a long time i raced with them back in the days already i knew kevin uh, see a bit he makes all this possible because the british city it's um, built on uh, a pro m category like back in the days i explained in gt masters so that's also for me um the perfect way um, to do motorsport, there is a guy who has the money and maybe some drivers who don't have the, the money, but they are really good in racing and, and motivated to make your the, the way through uh, the motorsport history. But um, yeah, I think it's really nice to to meet um, also the, the UK fans to drive on tracks I've never been before, like Snedderton. It's completely new for me. Uh, Alden Park was brand new. For sure, I, I knew I know uh, Silverstone, Brands Hatch, um, Spa, maybe racing, um, Donington. But for sure, um, I look forward to to have such nice tracks in in the in the in the season, and I can say um, I'm really happy and proud to. 
to get a chance racing one year in Asia, experience Suzuka, uh, Motegi, this Japan racetracks, and then year after, same in UK, meeting new people, new fans, new racetracks, you know, um, living my dream, uh, racing for Mercedes AMG around the world, uh, and, and having a great time. And I think um, that really counts. You know, if I look back in some years, I can say, look, I was there racing, I was there racing, I, I, I raced on this racetrack and on this and this and this. And this is actually a nice. Uh, on top, for sure, I want to, to win something. The season opener in uh, Old Park wasn't how we expected, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But uh, we come back um, next week in Silverstone. Um, there's a three-hour race. I think we were testing there. I think we, are, we, having a good, we have a good package. Um, I think our car will be quick there. Um, I'm fully motivated and also Kevin. And um, our goal is to be on a podium for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be that'd be good to see. And I and I do like Silverstone. I think it's well suited to GT racing. Just the layout. Yeah. And it's different like than that. Alden Park for sure because yeah, we we got penalties. I got track limit, which which was really on on my uh, hand. It was shit. And and if you have like a starting position seventeen or fifteen, Alden Park, forget it. You don't get any position, and then. Actually, the, the race was seven minutes under green. Yes. Uh, rest the rest was safety and car and, and raining and, and full course yellow. So, for sure, there's no chance to gain anything in Olden Park. But yeah. Silverstone will be different. It's a F1 circuit. It's uh, wide. It's a three hours race. So, it's a different story. And I think um, Kevin and myself, we are fully, fully honored to, to deliver. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I... Uh... I think I was at Donington Park yesterday and um, I was sort of, you know, I had this this like chat in mind and I was just looking at the circuit. Um, I walked around about half of it and I just, uh, yeah, it, it, it just feels a bit more suited to GT racing than, than say, Alton Park. Yeah. Nothing against yeah. Alton Park. It's I like this track. old school tracks, to be honest. Uh, it's outstanding. It's so crazy. I, I know Malaysia, Sipang, I know Shanghai, I know many other things. But then you come to Alden Park, you think you are sitting on an old go kart track back in back in twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, but now racing with a GT car on there, which is way too narrow. But yeah. if you're driving alone, so nice, so cool, yeah, it's so challenging. It's like a little notch life. It's really, oh, cool. really nice. Yeah. I've never heard Alden Park called that before. I think I yeah. might call it that from now on. That's uh, yeah, that's good. Um, but yeah, so 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 uh, Silverstone feels like it should be. Very, very good. Um, just very quickly, obviously, yeah. There's, there's a, there's a British audience tuning in, um, and there's a couple of uh, former uh, British touring car drivers on the grid. Uh, Rob and Ricky Collard are on the grid, and they did well last weekend. But um, um, I, I'm, I'm going to be following you this year. Um, why, why should the Brits follow Max Gertz this year? I mean, obviously, we've, we've got an idea about your character and your determination for it, but. Uh, you can sell yourself to the English fans if you like. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I saw on uh, on the starting list already in uh, Alton Park, there are not many, yeah, like uh, Ferg Ferg and uh, Flex on the on the grid. Yeah, uh, ninety five percent are British. Yes. Then there is one Italian, which is Lello or Marcello. Yeah. There is one German, one uh, from one guy from Hong Kong, which is my teammate. Kevin. Yeah. Um, Kevin. Uh, maybe they want to others, and yeah. I think we five, uh, us five. I think we mix all the British uh, gang yeah. through. You know, we mix it up with our nationals and our expertise, and also yeah, some some knowledge coming from other series. And I have to say, um, we delivered also nice uh, model cars already. Maybe I have one here. Oh, model cars. Let me check. Talking. Yeah, go for it. Like this one. Oh yes, that's yeah. very good. I do love the car this year. That's lovely. Yeah, that's super nice. And uh, we give out on every race week and hundred of these uh, model cars to to oh, fans, fantastic. to the audience. So uh, that's also a cool move from uh, Kevin, having already actual the the car model um, ready uh, to okay. give it to fans. And I think that's. What I also like in British GT, the fans are so close to us. Um, mm. the, the grid walk, the racetracks are narrow, so the people are sitting actually 
naturally on on the on the on the grass on the on the on the uh, cut of the of the track so that's really nice and yeah. uh, for sure um you will see me uh, um more times than than now on the podium in british gt for sure because never i was on the british gt podium uh it will come throughout the season for sure yeah absolutely absolutely and, and uh, uh, leonardo Am ambach was saying the only car without british um uh drivers on it that's also true yeah see and on that every makes... other car there is like a british uh, driver on it at least one yeah and our car is completely Foreign, foreign, so, I suppose. Foreign, yes. I guess. <laughs> foreign uh, car, yes. Yeah, no, you can see which which makes it unique, and that's a reason to follow you guys, of course. Um, I, I think it's the because you go to Donington twice, I think, don't you? I think it's the second uh, visit. I think uh, I'm I'm going to be there. So if if there can be 101 of those cars, that'd be great. I'll have one. Um, yeah. <laughs> that'd be cool. And uh, yeah, we've got uh, yeah said uh, said said that Max has already. Uh, made me uh, want to watch British GT. So there you go. We've got fans coming in watching our series. But yeah, looking forward to it, folks. So do do tune into British GT and obviously give Max a cheer. Um, um, okay, uh, we need to just um, wrap up a bit. It's two hours. It's flown by as it's always. It goes crazy. Very, yeah, it goes very very fast every time. I would. Um, let's have a quick look. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got to talk about um, very quickly German um, F1 drivers or drivers that are on the way up. I've got a note here. Obviously, we we know about Michael and Ralph and Mick, and yeah, we've got Seb Vettel, we've got Hans Stuck way back, Nick Heidfeld, and Beloff, and Danner, and Wolfgang von Trips years and years and years and mm. years ago. I'm not going to say his full name because we'll be here for another half hour. Um, he's got the longest name in motorsport. Um, you've got like, uh, we've got like so Sophia Flush doing well. Um, who do, who do you think is the next big young German talent coming through? I mean, I've been keeping an eye on uh, 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 Tim. Uh, uh, Tim. Damn it. He looks very good. Yeah. Looks yeah Tim, good. Tim I, I met him a few years ago already uh, when he did karting. Um, now he got his uh, Red Bull deal as a young driver, like uh, Sebastian Vettel back in the days. Um, mm. So he, he has now no, like what I wished also for me, Back in the days, um, he has a lot of background um, sponsorship now. Um, that's the most important. He is talented. He is quick. Um, he can drive now completely free in his head. Um, he needs to deliver for sure now. He needs to bring results because Dr. Marco wants to see uh, results. Uh, he wants to see uh, winning championships and races. And then if he does well, um, he has a bright future in front of him. Um, really, really cool. And I think he, he's, um, for, for us in Germany, um, actually the, the biggest um, iron in, in the heat, I would say, how you, how you call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the biggest iron in the fire. Yeah, the, in the fire. The big hope. Um, but also on the other side, I have to say, um, Sophia, I know her mm. also quite well. And Sofia is doing really well. Uh, he proved herself in Formula 3, uh, in, in LMP cars. Um, yeah. And he is always believing in, in her, in her talent. And what he is really good in, uh, it's marketing. And it's very good. Yeah. Um, maybe there are not many guys around in her age or even in my age who are on the same level than her. So we can learn a lot from her. In terms of this, maybe she can learn still a bit of, of like from us, from the older guys about racing, um, because she is she is willing to it. She calls me a few times a year and asking me what do you think about here and there and what I can do here on this track better than than I did in the past. So she is really on it, um, and and she is uh, really famous. I have to say in Germany, everybody knows her, and uh, <clears throat> this can help also find to to find sponsors and to find the way uh in motorsport and um, but what she wants um she wants to become the first uh, um woman f1 driver um female f1 driver which is for sure you need a goal in your life and she yeah. that's her goal and if she, if she works really hard maybe at one day she she she, she will get it yeah um same with me in dtm this was always a dream uh, to become DTM champion, I always dreamed of and I believed in. 
and um, I've done it. So why not? Yeah, absolutely. I think these are the, the the two German uh, race drivers we have to um, we have to an eye on it. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, there's been so many people have uh, messaged me saying, "When are you going to get Sophia Flersch on?" I was like, <laughs> "Very difficult," but yeah. she is because she's so in demand. But she and and right rightly so, she's very yeah, she's very impressive. And and to come back from the injury from Macau that we all yes. saw as well, it's incredible. Um, no, thank you. Um, okay, right. Uh, we also have some little fun, quick fire ish questions at the end, just to round up. And I ask them to everyone. Um, I think we've covered this. I mean, did you have a favorite driver when you were growing up? I think we've covered that one. Yeah, this um, was Michael Schumacher and Dan Schneider for sure. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, who do you admire the most today um, of the current races in, in any series? Is there one that you think? He or she it's, uh, the right way. It must be uh, Max Verstappen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people. I mean, people always say it's just the car, but they said the same no. thing with Lewis, and it's a load of rubbish. It's absolutely yeah. nonsense. Yeah, I think. But how uh, he works, how 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 good is his uh, natural speed? It's crazy. I mean, it's. Uh, I talked to many other guys. Uh, he's um, on it. Whatever he he does, uh, it doesn't matter if it's simulator racing. Or pure racing or whatever he always wants to win he always trains so hard and his pure speed is fast it's just um uh, it's whatever it's a uh, it's, it's crazy it's, i mean for me he's uh, maybe he becomes the most successful and, and quickest driver we ever had but uh you know, we don't know but um for me at the moment that's max verstappen yes yeah it's it's hard not to be impressed isn't it um he's very very good um have you got a favorite car that you've raced on on track um yeah there were many of course i like the class one dtm cars mm. a lot uh, because of the the aero but uh if i look back uh, i have to say the cars which i won my my titles uh for for sure dtm uh, on the mg gt3 yeah. And then on the SLS, um, these were the most uh, emotional race cars to me. But uh, with the most fun, uh, I have to say the Class 1 DTM. Pretty cool. I was able to drive an old DTM car from 1996 from Ben wow. Schneider. I raced, wow. um, I drove um, some old F historic Formula 1 cars, um, like from Niki Lauda and from yeah james hunt and mclaren That's from back cool. in the days so actually these cars were also at this time really powerful and, and and fast and challenging um yeah so there were many cars but the most emotionally for me is for sure my dtm winning car or gt3 car in the sls fantastic good stuff um <clears throat> again touched on it earlier i mean is there any series that you'd like to have a a tryout whether it be like supercars or nascar or you know you mentioned you'd love you would love to do Le Mans. i mean would you like to do it in the in the hypercar or is there anything that you'd like to really yeah um for sure winning Le Mans would be something special overall um of course then i need to be in hypercar but if you talk to um, drivers from lmdh they are not really happy about it how it comes because in um low and medium or low and medium speed corners the car is really not fun to drive it's only a bit of high speed and the pure acceleration which is nice but um the cars are just too heavy and too lazy and too slow in in, in low and medium speed corners so in the end um challenging wise i think it's not a big deal um for those guys who did dtm you are they are used to aerodynamic cars i think that's not a big big change i talked shortly to um to marco whitman which uh confirmed that uh, all the old DTM class one cars are much nicer and much better to drive than the current LMDH cars. Um, right. Also, the all DTM cars had much more aero than the current LMP LMDH cars. So um, then I would rather say, uh, let's go to Australia to V8 V8 supercars. I'm so glad you it, said that. Would I'm be a, I'm a great. Because I know uh, Jamie Wincup well, and um uh, uh jamie jamie uh, van gisbergen uh, um shane van gisbergen uh because both of them were my teammates in Bathurst. i know roland dane 
Uh, he's from UK. He runs the Triple Eight uh, team over there. So there are some contacts for sure. Maybe at one day I will get a chance. But this would be like a series which um, I also my driving style would really fit into it. I would say. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it, it's a it's a fantastic series, and I've always loved it. Obviously, it was the Bathurst was the first one I ever saw. I think it's the same for a lot of people. And uh, yeah, what a fantastic series! That'd be cool. Um, Okay, the final one. Um, you've shared the track with a lot of great drivers. I'm not. I've just got a few here. I'm not going to name all of them, but you've. Uh, I saw that you actually shared the track with my uh, with uh, Michael Bartels, which was cool, and with Tom Coronel. So that's always a nice yes. series, isn't it? We're racing with Tom Coronel. My goodness. Um, you've got like Richard Westbrook, and obviously, uh, you know, your friend Ad Adrian Sutter. You've got Rene Rast, and you know, uh, Tom Blomqvist, and Van Tours, and Peter Dunbreck, and. Bearline and Glock and Kubica and Zanardi, France and Rosberg, Hamilton. It's so many terrific drivers many. to share the track with. Um, are there any that stand out as being not the best, but just kind of just so, so good at what they do? This feels like a very obvious answer, but <laughs> yeah. are there any that... All of them, all of them were pretty good, um, I have to say. I'm, I'm proud to be in the same name in the same line line and ranking with them you know winning titles and this and this um but for me i have to say one of the most impressive guys i've ever met was uh, alexander zanardi which uh i don't know what is his shape is now at the moment nobody knows really yeah, i don't know quiet, but um i was able to travel around the world with him for one year um, um we were side by side with our motorhomes in the paddock it was back in in the days when he did uh Blopin gt or like the gt world challenge yeah. uh on the bmw and it's at four um and we shared so many good times in the paddock uh, together we grilled uh, we had barbecue together you know we had a, a beer together, drinks, good talks, um, uh, talking about F1 times, about his crash, about his recovery. And if I see him now again in, in such a bad situation, mm. I have to say uh, it's, it's crazy and it's unfair because he's such a great and strong personality. And he opened me the eyes as well uh, to work even harder to achieve your goals, your dreams, um, as, as he did. So he is really, for me, um, a guy which is a perfect race driver, a really good race driver. He did Chem Car, he did F1, he did touring cars. He did nearly everything on earth what you can imagine on, on racing. On, on the other side, he got um, a few uh, really bad, uh, uh, how to call it, down downsides. Yeah. Yeah, well, some, kind of some, some very but, bad ones. Yeah. Yes, but he was still always in a very good positive mood, and this uh, it's it's crazy to see. So, for sure, he is one of the guys which um, yeah, I take like Nicky Lauda takes the head off <laughs> yes. out to him. It's it's really that's a guy which always is in my heart and in my memories. Yeah, I think that's lovely, and you know, for him to go through what he's been through and still come out the other side and win Olympic gold and one of the most amazing guys I think most sports ever seen. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's I think that's a lovely way. Uh that's a lovely way to finish. Um firstly everyone in the comments, thank you very much for the comments and everything. Well I've been watching them all come through. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um thank you for the support and of course the biggest thanks uh uh, uh to you Max. It's been Brilliant speaking with you. I've been looking forward to it, and it certainly has come down. It's it's been great hearing about your career. Um, so thank you very much for coming on, and wishing you all the very best for uh, this season, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed the time with me, and you got some more in insights. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to meet you around the world on any racetrack. Uh, next one, Silverstone, then Brands Hatch, and then Nürburgring, maybe. Some of you are in um, Buriram because that's uh, a race which I always also do um, before the 24 hours race at Nürburgring. So, yeah, busy day, busy weeks ahead. And thanks for joining us. And thanks for that. And see you. Yeah, great stuff. Fantastic. And I will come and say hi at one of the rounds this weekend. Uh, cool. Sorry, this, this season, of course. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Great stuff. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you again very soon. Good night. Thank you.